There's already people are going, but Simon, the last season, it was so bad, I hated it, and none of it made any sense. Well, I don't really look at stuff like that. A week or so ago, I put a little post in the community feed on YouTube saying, look guys, what kind of content would you like to see me do? Because without you, I'm nothing. I'm just a tadpole in a pond waiting to drown. And because we do have more time on our hands at the moment, given that it's locked down, it's like, man, we can just crank out some different content. And if it appeases you, then it appeases me down, down in my soul. And one of them was, oh, Miller, I'd love to know what your favorite movies are. I'd love to know what your favorite TV shows are. And we did movies, did it ages ago. Hopefully I remembered to put the card up so you can go check that one out. Forgot loads in that, but whatever. But we've never done TV shows. So I thought, hey, we can talk about that. Now, obviously, it's not a definitive list because I would have forgotten more here. And it changes day to day, but that doesn't create engagement. That doesn't create reaction. So I'm going to say from 10 to 1, these are 100% my list. Let's do it. Number 10 is already controversial because it's Game of Thrones. Since when does old Walter give us two feasts in a single fortnight? So already people are going, but Simon, the last season, it was so bad, I hated it, and none of it made any sense. Well, I don't really look at stuff like that. I think one of my favorite things about any creative endeavor is that even if you don't like something, you can still take something from it because you can go like, okay, well, why did the writers want to go in that direction? And, you know, why do they do this and why do that? I don't want to get too off track, but Mass Effect 3 is an incredible example of that. If you're not into video games, basically the fan base hated the ending of Mass Effect 3 to such a degree by where the developer, they changed it. <laughs> they released DLC and they changed it. It did have some weird ghost kid, but we're not talking about Mass Effect 3 right now. Now, the reason Game of Thrones gets in here, I will say, I think the first chunk of Game of Thrones, well, they're 10 seasons, so the first five seasons, six seasons are probably better than the latter ones but that's like saying that you know i prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla ice cream actually don't prefer vanilla point is i like any kind of ice cream and i couldn't not put it in this because i started watching it on a random bank holiday weekend years ago they had it this is how old it was they had the box set on sale dvds DVD, no one uses dvds anymore you know man you're like we'll see my dvds you're like netflix granddad you asshole um but yeah and i watched the first episode and we all know, I won't spoil anything. You all know what happens at the end of the first episode if you do know. And again, I was so like, what the flub is this? That I watched basically the first three seasons in around about four days. And that makes me a massive nerd and a massive geek. Obviously got to the Red Wedding and it blew my mind. And just the rate that they would kill off characters... It, again, I just couldn't believe it. It was so different to what I was used to. And I do like the fantasy genre when it comes to video games, mostly. I don't read a lot of fantasy books, but I realized once that like Harry Potter, I've never really, that's not my thing. But stuff like Oblivion and Shadow of the Colossus, which is kind of fantasy-esque, I kind of felt like it grabbed whatever those things have and it was just put here into Game of Thrones. And yes, some of the characters went on strange arcs. Uh, before the end, I felt like they were focusing on people. Well, I'd rather they were focusing on others but if I watched that many seasons, and I, I'd done five seasons in about a week. Like, it was one of the only things I've ever binged in my life because I just couldn't get enough. I just couldn't get enough. And that's why it's in at number 10. Number nine is one that nobody will have, probably. And it's from the files of Police Squad, or Police Squad, whatever the hell you want to call it. Our next stop was a neighborhood known as Little Italy. A criminal investigation seldom follows a straightforward, clear-cut course. It is the TV series that inspired the Naked Gun films, and the Naked Gun films are among my favorite films ever. I think Leslie Nielsen is a hero. Uh, when he passed away, I was driving, and I was genuinely sad, pulled over to a service station, and it took a moment because I'm a massive loser. But it's true. It's like him and Mel Brooks are two people, and Monty Python, talk about that. But those two guys, um, I don't know, they just spoke to me. They spoke to me when I was a kid. And... From the Files of Police Squad didn't find massive success, which is still kind of nuts that they made a television show, a, t a film out of it. But the cool thing there is you see how they reuse loads of jokes. So they just went, look, we think that was a really funny gag. And nobody saw it. So now somehow we're making a movie made. The jokes are going back in there. But it's just, it's so dumb. It's so stupid. If you don't like that kind of humor, no, you're not going to get into it. It's the same as Airplane and things like that. But it just gets me. It just does. I chuckle at it all the time. Again, I've got the, that, that one you do need a DVD box set for because I've never seen it on any kind of streaming service, which also kind of sums it up. But it's like, um, what's the word? Like a guilty pleasure of mine. But not even a guilty. I'm proud of it. It's a proud pleasure of mine. If you like dumb ship, check it out. Number eight. I'm pretty sure Americans know what this is because BBC America has uh, a certain reach. And it's, it's a cult classic, but it's Red Dwarf. Step up to Red Alert. Uh, sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. I try. I should really explain these things in case you don't know what they are. I, how you explain Red Dwarf, I don't know. It's a bunch of dudes lost in space after their mining ship, Red Dwarf, has a crew on it. They all get killed by a radiation leak. 
Lister is in status because he smuggled a cat on board. It sounds awful describing it. So it's the last human in the world, we think, Lister. It's his dead mate, Rimmer, who comes back as the ship's hologram. Uh, you've got the computer, the AI, which is Holly. They eventually find Crichton, who's an android on a planet. And the cat that Lister snuck on board becomes the cat, basically just turns in, into a human. I mean, the latter stuff that they've done, I can't remember the name of the, the two-part feature they did this year. It was okay, right? And I think I mostly enjoyed it from nostalgia. But there was a period there when, honestly, especially when I was a kid, I just thought it was brilliant. I remember when Arnold Rimmer was written out of the show, Chris Barry, I suppose because he was doing... Uh, Mr. Britis, whatever that thing was called. I don't remember what that show was called. Whatever. He was written out of it. Genuinely ter devastated. I remember lying in my bed at night, uh, facing the window. Don't know, The weird things our brains hold on to are so sad. So sad that Rimmel was no longer in Red, no longer in Red Dwarf. But um, yeah, it's, if you haven't seen episodes like Back to Reality, which of its time, I mean, maybe if you look back now, like, that's not very clever, but I still think of its time, so clever, and again, never took itself too seriously, proper tongue-in-cheek, went from sort of witty dialogue to stupid dialogue, you know, within a couple of scenes, Crichton to me is one of the most underrated characters ever, really, really is, he has so many good lines, Red Dwarf is good. Number seven, now we do head more into a serious direction, it's the world at war. The of Versailles in 1919 had bitten deep into Germany's frontiers. Which obviously, I don't need to explain that. It's a documentary series about World War II. And I mean, honestly, I, I'm, you may not know this about me. I love World War II, which is a terrible sentence to say. What I should say is that I'm fascinated by World War II. But it goes into so much depth about that period. It's unreal. I think it was the most expensive factual documentary ever made at one point. I think it was made for something like £900,000 or dollars, I don't remember. And in modern day money, that's like 11 million, which is which is utterly unreal. But again, it, A, it will open your eyes because we realise how privileged we are and how much my word, you know, our, our, our grands, whatever, our old people suffered back in the day. And once it's got its claws in you, you will watch, and it's, there's loads, but it, you would just watch it over and over and over again. Uh, to me, there are some things that should be made essential viewing. Obviously not really, because we've all got lives and you need to focus on you. But yeah, it's just it's just amazing. There is no even point in me sat here trying to explain it. You know what World War II is. Uh, it had to be documented in some sense. And these guys went out of their way to, to do that. And it's a massive box set. Like, I had one VHS it's so old. I think it came out in the 70s. I've got them somewhere around here. I don't know. Obviously, I wouldn't watch it on VHS now. Don't have a VHS player. It's more like a weapon if I did have one. But yeah, I remember when I first saw it when I was sort of early 20s, got really into World War II during um, history when I was in high school. And ever since then, and I learned about this thing, I was like, screw it. You know, I had quite a nine to five job at the time. And I just spent my evenings just watching every single episode. I thought, no way, no way, no way, no way. And, you know, for as, as much as we think we know, at least from my vantage point, as much as I thought I did knew, I knew diddly squat. And to sort of be able to take this education on and also feel like I think it's important given what it was. World of War gets two thumbs up, but you know, for bad reasons. Number six is Batman, the animated series. If you've been on my channel a while, you know that I'm obsessed with Batman. I think he's the greatest person in the world. All the love to Batman. And the Batman animated series sums this character up because ultimately it's meant for kids, right? Of course it's meant for kids. But because they understood the Batman character so well, and I've said this time and time again, and I'll say it again now, if you do that, it doesn't matter what else you do around Bruce Wayne slash The Dark Knight, it will work. And, you know, Batman here is, he has that dark edge to him. He has the, the challenges that a psychopath, which is what I always call him, or a sociopath, would have to face. And it also has some incredible performances, like Kevin Conroy as Batman, could be the best one. That's up for debate. Please debate it below. You've got Mark Hamill, obviously Mr. Luke Skywalker, as the Joker. Probably the best Joker ever. And the amount of enemies they go through, the stories they go through, there's emotions there. Robin joins at one point. You're like, oh, for Pete's sake. But, you know, it's always going to happen. You have to evolve these things. You have to progress them. I can't think how long it's been off television now. I'm pretty sure it was in the 90s. I think that's right. I watched it, obviously, in my younger years. But you can go back to it now. And it just tells a great Batman story. Well, not just one. It tells multiple great Batman stories. I just, I love it. It's kind of like Lego Batman too. I don't want to get too off track here, but Lego Batman did the same thing because it completely understood the core of what this persona should be. You can even have goofiness around it and it still works. And maybe the Batman animated series does it better. In fact, it probably does because there's so many series and there's so many episodes. If you like Batman or maybe you've just got into him recently, I don't know, promise you check him out. I think it's on Amazon or Netflix or something. It is so damn good. Number five is Faulty Towers. Are you the manager? I am the owner, madam. What? I am the owner. 
I want to speak to the manager. I am the manager too. What? I am the manager as well. I'm 99% sure this made it to America. I mean, I don't know, right? Because I don't live there. Obviously, John Cleese's um, spin-off project, not the right word, but, you know, wasn't Monty Python based. It's, there was, there's 10 episodes? Or is there even less? There's one series. Or was there two? No, I think there's two series, 10 episodes, 12. I don't know. Anyway, there's barely any, right? He could have made a thousand more and everybody would have wanted it. It's just British humor done perfectly, as far as I'm concerned. And the reason I will always love it is that I've been watching that now for around about, what was it, about 10? So about 20 years. And it still makes me laugh. And I still look forward to certain bits. And John Cleese's performance as Basil Fawlty, just the biggest asshole hotel owner in the history of the world, it's great. It's great. It kind of ties into what my number one is as well. So I think I just enjoy characters that walk around saying and doing whatever the hell they please and not giving a damn about the consequences. Um, I would obviously implore anyone to check this out. I can understand you saying, yeah, it's not ready for me. But just watch the first episode. Because the cool thing is, if you like the first episode... Every other one after that just gets better and better still. It's a classic, it's legendary, and I'll probably watch it at least once a year until I'm dead. Number four is Seinfeld. What are you doing? <laughs> what? Did, did you just double dip that shit? Kind of for the same reasons. I just love Jerry Seinfeld. I think he's hilarious. The fact he went out there and made a show about nothing is is brilliant and george costanza again is one of the best characters ever because again it ties in the person <laughs> you already figured out what number one is if you know what i'm talking about but you also have julia louis dreyfus in it what elaine is one of the best again she that, that that show does not work without elaine like so many people talk about kramer and of course george costanza and jerry seinfeld and i mean if you want to see sort of a bunch of uh, actors and actresses that are about to make it massive in the tv world just watch seinfeld they're all there but i always thought that the elaine character was the thing that held it all together so funny so self-assured such an asshole i mean it's brilliant and it has aged a little bit just because it has you know everyone's got old technology and whatnot but the jokes remain the same and it's also one of the first things i'd ever seen where it punished you if you had watched earlier shows they would make callbacks all the time and if you would just join randomly in season five you'd be like i have no idea what they're talking about and it's so successful it's still um, being shown today on what's it called i can't remember when you license stuff out and send it round and round whatever it's called they're still doing that they still make money from it. And if they wanted to continue, Jerry Seinfeld and the other man, who obviously I'm leaving out for obvious reasons, uh, I think they've got offered hundreds of millions of dollars. They're both worth over a billion dollars. And that is because of Seinfeld. Now, being offered a bunch of money doesn't mean you've created something that everyone thinks is great. But to me, Seinfeld is flipping brilliant. Uh, just to be controversial, because it wind people up a thousand times better than Friends. Uh, Friends basically ripped it off. Genuinely think that. I know. I know. Bald asshole right here. Uh, again, something I watch all the time, something that I will always just, if I catch it on TV, I watch the end of the episode, and I'm such a dick with it. If people tell me they don't get Seinfeld, I kind of dislike them less. Number three and two, you can kind of interchange these ones, but I'll, I'll sum up my argument for you. Number three is South Park. You should tell Asimo all your most personal secrets. Asimo will not make fun of you or tell your secrets to other people instead. Okay, number two is The Simpsons. And it gets kind oh. of you can stay, but I'm leaving. Yellow if they're using late season apples. And of course, in Canada, the whole thing's flip flop. The way I've always said it is when The Simpsons is good, it is untouchable. Like, there is nothing funnier, cartoon wise especially, than The Simpsons. But I feel like South Park, when you take them season versus season, or all their seasons together, I think South Park is more consistently good, if that makes any sense. But. Again, The Simpsons is something that everybody says. Everybody says it. And there's a reason for that, right? You know, the hell was that? But there's a reason for that because when something does get to that kind of, of level, it's because it's connecting with people. And it's just some of the writing, the fact that, you know, the, the you start the early seasons, the focus is clearly on Bar, and then by the end of it, Homer Simpson has taken on. And the sheer cast of characters, everybody has a favorite secondary Simpson character. Mine is Montgomery Burns. I think Mr. Burns is absolutely wonderful as this kind of, again, crazy man, but also has somewhat of a heart, but doesn't, is inherently evil. Uh, the operation when he manages to make all his money back by basically killing fish. That's a thousand thumbs up from me. And South Park, again, I don't massively like the early seasons of South Park. It's more immature humor i still enjoy it don't get me wrong of course i do but almost when the south park hype bubble had burst and trey parker and matt stone decided to get way satirical and political that's when it's at its best and also they have one of the last shows on tv where they can do whatever they want 
And there's sometimes there's controversy, but nowhere near as much controversy as there was if somebody else had just started it. I still can't believe some of the things they get away with, but it cracks me up. I quite like being shocked. I quite like shock humor. There's a line to it. And if people are saying, if there's no depth to it, no, I don't like that at all. You shouldn't make shocking jokes because ha ha, funny, funny. No, don't upset people. Uh, but yeah, I watch these all the time. Uh, I probably could watch them again until the day I pass away and I would always find something funny with it. I mean, the awesome episode, awesome episode of South Park is an all timer and will probably remain untouched. And number one, you've already figured out, it's Curb Your Enthusiasm. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that I hope you weren't upset about the shushing, because, no, you know, a lot of people... Look, I'm not gonna lie to you, nobody likes to be shushed. Yeah. Again, you could probably say it's interchangeable with Seinfeld, depending on the day, but this is more relevant and current, because obviously season 10 just came out a few months ago. Larry David is just my secret hero. I mean, I would never live my life like that. Hopefully that comes across on my videos. But it's just small things. Larry, do you want to hang out this weekend? No, why not? Don't want to see you. It's just, imagine we lived in that world. Wouldn't it be so much better if you could be that direct with people? Obviously, people still get upset and hurt in Curb Your Enthusiasm. So that's an issue too. But he just sees the world in a way where sometimes, even I, I, I think to myself, I kind of look at it. I see it that way too, even though I know it's wrong. And the little things that wind him up, I'm like, man, I have loads of little things like that. They don't annoy me as much as they annoy Larry David. But I also, I love the performance of it. I love that you have the real life Larry David, who's kind of this character, turned up to 11. So it was like pro wrestling. We know how much I love that. But also the fact there's no real script. Like there's an idea and there's certain you know points they have to hit. But otherwise, they just riff off each other. And you can see that far more in the earlier series. Everybody involved gets so much better at it as we, as we go on through the years. But it's such a great concept. And I think it stands to how good the actors are in it to be able to pull that off. Susie Green, for example. Susie Green is a damn hero. I mean, insane, but an absolute damn hero. And there's just so many lines from it, so many jokes from it. Again, like as soon as I saw he was doing season 10, I figured out what I had to buy. Like, what service do I need to ensure that I see this? I watched his movie that he, he did. I can't remember what it's called now. It was all right. Kind of, kind of weird. Not really what I was expecting. Kirby Enthusiasm is great. If you don't know what I'm talking about, start with season one. Persevere. It's very, very slow to begin, but eventually you'll get into the pacing. It's the best. And that's that. That's my 10 favorite TV shows ever. You don't agree, you're already in the comments, but that works for me. Like the video, share the video, hit the bell button. Please hit the bell button. Hit the subscribe button. Let me know what kind of stuff you want. I've Again, I've got the time on my hands. If I can grow my channel, I certainly uh, I certainly want to. There'll be more videos on screen now. Click them, stick with me on my little journey. Go to Patreon, patreon.com. Forward to Simon316, check the description. All the information in there. I'll see you soon.